In this video today, we're going to be looking at five of the key techniques and tips for being able to get you beyond that level of 512 route climbing or 7A uh, sport climbing and to really progress you beyond those grades. And I'm gonna get into some of the most important things and show you on the wall behind us those ways of moving that are more efficient they're more progressive in terms of moving you through the grades and also demonstrate a couple of kind of the mistakes that people typically make and get held back by at this kind of grade. So we're talking about that 512, French 7A and beyond progression in terms of grades. five things that we go through on this video are not just techniques. So we're not just looking at drop knees and heels, for example. We're also looking at some movement skills and techniques that you would use in the wall, like pacing and how you might use resting. So I really want to be broad on this and not just take specific drills that you do on the wall. So the first exercise that we're going to look at on the wall is a twist lock. And this is a method of climbing on the wall and it's particularly useful for steep terrain because it allows you to move your center of gravity much closer to the wall and also use the mechanical advantage that you have in terms of how your shoulders and arms work with the contact points on the wall. And in terms of the points that you're looking for on the wall and what you really wanna watch for is that when I have my hand on the hold here is I wanna see the opposite shoulder move relatively close to that hand. So I'm twist and locking in. So if I've got the hold there with that hand is that this shoulder is coming in and going closer. If you see a move where the hand is on the hold here and this opposite shoulder is staying quite a distance, this is typically uh, indicative of someone climbing much more square on. And the problem for root climbers when they're moving through those middle grades is that they'll often feel strong in this position, but once you repeat that move over and over again, climbing really square on and using all the muscle and the strength that you have involved for that move, it really fatigues you and it becomes a massive limiting factor in terms of how high you'll get on those routes. So let's have a look at some twist lock examples on a problem. So I'm gonna go from my black hold here to purple, to next purple and then over to the big blue sloper at the top. And what I'm gonna do on this is I'm gonna make sure that I position my feet each time so that I'm able to twist in and not stay square on. This will often mean that I'll have to flag outwards from the center line from where I'm climbing. I can't stay square underneath the problem or underneath the move. So you can see here that I'm gonna to have to step out wide there to be able to twist and lock. And then I'm gonna bring my feet through and again, stepping out sideways so I can twist and lock. Bring my feet through. And then twist and lock. So if I give you a demo of exactly the same problem, climbing in a more square on style now, it feels still relatively easy to do it in this way, but I'm using a lot more strength to be able to do it and add up if I have to do 20, 30, 40 moves in a row in this manner. And you'll see that my shoulder for this opposite hand where I'm pulling on here will stay a greater distance away. On this hand here, this shoulder is gonna stay further away. So if I compare those two methods of climbing, they both feel perfectly reasonable, but in terms of root climbers, it's just so important to get that efficiency right. That twist lock rolling around the shoulders really adds up on multiple moves. And it's one of the key things that I see really change on climbers when they transition from that 7A, 512 standard up into those 513s and 8As. That twist lock becomes a really refined, well-used technique. Okay, next one to get right in terms of that progression through those grades is the use of your heels. And you're probably gonna think that I'm gonna talk about heel hooking technique or heel plants, 
But really what I'm talking about here is how you use your heels on resting positions. This is a thing I don't see people use very well on roots, but can have a massive influence for how good a rest is. And I'm gonna show you two different ways of using your heels for rests on a particular sequence or a spot that you might have on a climb. And this can make a rest feel something that you might go from just 20 seconds, hanging out, quickly shaking out, to camping out for you know one or two minutes, really de-pumping. If you can do that, much higher chance of getting up your route. So first one is the heel toe lock. And this is something I've used so many times on routes. And I take my time to discover this you know, position on a route and where I can possibly use this because this is a real game changer. And what we're trying to do is place our heel on one hold lower down and then the toe behind a hold higher up. So you're almost jamming it between what is effectively two sides of a crack. But on roots, they often don't feel like or look like horizontal cracks. So you have to look for nubbins and uh, little mini overhangs and small slabby sections of the rock where you can create this kind of effective jam and it's massively advantageous to you. So here, I haven't got a crack. I've just got a little mini roof here and a sort of big slabby hold. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place my heel and toe into that position and then to lock it, I've really got to sit down on that hold and come underneath it. So I'm applying loads of pressure to the top of the foot. If I try and rest on this hold up here, I just can't get enough force through it. So I must come down underneath it. And this feels really hard on my shin. I would say here I'm at maybe 80% of max on my shin in terms of how hard I'm working. But that means I can really relax on my hands here and get a proper rest. So loads of effort on my shin. And probably within another minute, I'll totally burn through on that shin muscle and I won't be able to do this move anymore, but I've totally relaxed my hands as a result. And that's a really good strategy to use on roots. Another one I'll show you is the heel and heel plant. So a double heel plant. So we often use our heel plant where we sit on our heel on the wall and we get a lot of weight on it. And it's particularly useful for those kind of poor rests where you really don't feel like you can get enough out of it. But if you use those two heels in opposition, it's amazing how much weight you can get off your hands and also get your hips right into the rock. And it's another very underused technique, but I sneak this technique in so much on different routes that I've tried over the years and it's made a massive effect on it. So the sequence I'm gonna kind of show you here is I've got these two big slopey holds. They're kind of okay, but not amazing for a rest. And I've got a big slopey ledge here for one heel. And then I've got what I've spotted is a little heel down left that I might be able to use in some sort of oppositional heel plant clamp. So if I climb up into my position and I put that heel on there and put it on. Yeah, it's not that great. I'm just sort of slightly coming off. So if I try that again, but this time bring that other heel in opposition and create some tension between those hands. Now, I've got a chance to take both hands off and really recover. And what I must do on this again is drop my hips as low as possible and create as much tension as possible through my hands, sorry, through my legs, so that I can actually rest my hands. So I'm quite content to really exhaust my lower body in this position so that I can make some kind of advantage for my hands so that I can really rest and get a recovery so then I can move on with my next sequence. So that's two ways of using your heels on roots, which I think can be big game changers. Don't see a lot of people do that in that kind of grade range, but you move into those climbers who are much more experienced, higher up in the grades, they'll use these a lot and I've seen them used a lot on roots. And often people will claim that the roots suddenly, you know, two or three grades easier because they've discovered this, but use it to your advantage. Another big change that I really see occur from that transition through from 512 and 7A through to 513s and 8A and beyond in terms of climbing is the ability for climbers to be able to choose sequences and methods for climbing uh, cruxes and, and roots that are based on the efficiency of movement and not the hot size of hold. Because what happens when you, you first start climbing slightly harder is that you default to just picking the biggest holds. You're like, that's a big ledge. 
That's a big jug. That's a big flat sloper there. I'm just going to go for that because it seems obvious and it's big. And this can actually really lead you into some really erroneous sequences on roots. And I think a big change that occurs is that over time you start to really focus on the most efficient way of moving rather than just going for big obvious holds. And I've got an example here that I'm going to show you just to kind of demonstrate this. Um, because one sequence has a massive hold that you go, yeah, I'll definitely use that, but it's harder. And then the other has much more subtle holds, but it's actually a much easier sequence. And that's over here. So I've got a little pinch and a crimp on here, a bit of dust on there. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to be doing a rollover move to come up to this black flat edge here. And for my feet, I've got a small black edge down here a little flat kind of uh, pinchy slopey black here and I've also got this massive great yellow ledge for my left foot and what most people will do is they'll set themselves up for this move and they'll see that huge great yellow volume and whether it's indoors or this is just a big ledge outside they will invariably use that really big hold because they just think it's big I've got to use it but there's a slightly better way of doing this and that's choosing these smaller holds, but realizing that I can create a lot of tension and opposition between my feet with a nice deep drop knee and the move suddenly becomes much easier. So I'll give you a demonstration of the, the kind of obvious, but not as good way, first of all, and then I'll show you the more subtle, but more efficient way of climbing it. So first up, left on the pinch, massive, massive great ledge here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to chuck so we can come over. So the move's possible, but it's a bit of a chuck. It's a relatively hard move, and it's probably not something that I'd want to do in the middle of a route when I'm pumped. I'm really gonna struggle to find that power and the ability to pull off a much harder move like that. Whereas if I go for the less obvious, more subtle technique, is I've got that left foot on that edge there, and then I'm finding my flatter pinch on here, and I'm really dropping my knees in and coming close to the wall, and then I can come up really slowly and steadily. And that's probably two V grades easier by taking the more subtle but better body position on that route because I turned off and just didn't go for that massive great ledgy hold. So think about your body position over hold size. I think this is a really key change and transition that you can make in your own climbing. Another massive influence that you can have on your route climbing ability is the skill of being able to moderate your pace and also becoming really aware of your pace. And that's across movement styles from you know, on-site climbing all the way through to red point projecting. And why pacing is so important is that it affects the duration and the time under tension that you have on a rock or on a route. And I'm gonna give you a little demonstration of this um, on the lattice board on our fusion holds which is just like a systemized um, root grade on this board. I'm gonna try something which is around an 8A root grade, and I need to be able to complete 70 moves to do my 8A. So this is a systematic way of doing 70 moves in equals 8A, and I'm gonna do this at a good pace, so something that I think is efficient, and then I'm gonna demonstrate it afterwards at a slow pace that I often see people in that 7A to 512 range before they get into the higher grades and the kind of pace that they often move at, which is slower. And I'm just going to show you how much this costs you and how much harder it is to get up that 8A using a much slower pace, even though it's exactly the same size of holds and I know this circuit really well. So what I'm going to do on this circuit now is I'm going to try and complete 70 moves. Um, I'm going to be using the yellow fusion holds and the power up buttons for my feet and I'm trying to complete my 8A circuit. So if I get going on it. For a while, these moves are gonna feel pretty okay. And it's all fairly in control. And I'm climbing at what I consider an efficient, steady pace, not rushing, not dwaddling, not taking too long.
Ooh. <sighs> okay, so I've completed my 70 move 8A circuit on my board just now. And uh, I know that circuit well. I can complete that more or less on demand on any particular day. Uh, it feels pretty pumpy. Um, it's quite hard, but I can definitely do it. And it's within my capacity. And what we're gonna do now is look at how that feels when we really slow the pace down. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go and climb that exact same circuit on the board behind me, but really slow the pace down so that in the same time period, there's absolutely no chance that I'm gonna cover the same amount of moves. And I'm gonna give you kind of like a, essentially a live demo of how much worse it is and how much it feels harder to be able to climb at a slower pace on exactly the same holds, the same sequence. I know the sequence really well. I've got it really dialed. And just to give you an example of how much that makes a difference because pacing is such a big factor. Okay, so I've just done that circuit or tried that circuit again at a much slower pace. So in that same time period, I only covered a little bit under sort of three quarters of the original moves from that circuit. So I didn't complete my 8A. And what was really interesting was that it kind of goes without saying that I wasn't gonna complete the number of moves because I was climbing a lot slower. So we know that, that's a foregone conclusion. That's an influence. But secondly, is because I was really slowing the pace down and my contact time increased on those moves, it felt so much harder. Like I was just pumped out of my mind on something, you know, that was just 50 moves. 50 moves is not so bad on this circuit and I should be able to comfortably be able to do that, but I was at my absolute limit. So not only did I not complete my 70 move goal, I was pumped out of my mind at 50 moves. So that kind of explains to you on a very standardized systematic circuit here, how big an influence that pacing is. Okay, last tip or technique that I'm gonna show you on the wall, which is a real game changer in terms of how you move is using a technique which is like called micro flicks or micro shakes for controlling the level of pump that you achieve on a route. And when you see lower grade climbers, what they typically do is they grab a hold and they just vigorously like really frantically try and shake out an arm to be able to get a rest and they swap over and they really frantically try and shake out that arm. And this is kind of like what you end up do, doing at the last resort in a way. And what I would always like to see people do in terms of how they cope with and recover mid route is using this micro flick, flick technique. So I'm gonna demo this on the wall in front of you. And it's all about taking very small micro flicks and relaxing the forearm as you're climbing around. And it moves really well within the kind of natural pace of climbing. So if I jump on the wall here, it's a little flick. A little flick, a little flick. A little flick, a little flick. A little flick. So you can see I'm just using these really small little flicks as I'm going through. So it's almost like they get hidden in the movement as I climb around the wall and you barely notice them, but they have a really big influence in terms of how you recover on the wall. So you barely notice them, but all the time I'm getting those little micro recoveries. There you have it. Little micro flex all the way around, probably half a second for each one. But it means I'm just getting a tiny little bit of relaxation on the forearm on each move. And it works really well within that natural movement and flow on the wall. So five tips, techniques, which I think are critical to get right, really dial down and perfect 
over those years of progressing from that 512, 7A kind of root grade all the way through to 513s and 8A. Work on them, perfect them, get them right. It will have a massive influence on your climbing. Mm -hmm.